Hey guys, good day, and thank you for coming back to the next video. Guys, I want to talk about something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart when it comes to when it comes to biblical prophecy, and it's it's this idea of the house of Israel and Israel. And uh, on my community page, um, I asked a question just to get a sense on where people were, and it said, uh, "My question was, what tribe or tribes were designated by God to carry the name of Israel?" And pretty much, uh, I got good answers. Um, the answer is that uh, typically I would um, only I think people like this guy right here, um, A. Curry, says Ephraim and Manasseh, or specifically Ephraim, who would rule over the older brother Manasseh, and he quotes the correct scripture. And um, I want to jump into that, but the reason I want to get into that, and I know you guys know where I stand on this, is because of another prophecy that uh, prophecy geeks have been looking at for eons. Um, Ezekiel 38 and 39 and based upon this information I, I you know I, I kind of ignored this prophecy for a long time because I could not figure out is it really saying what I'm thinking it's saying this idea of the unwalled villages and we're gonna get into that but before I get into that because I know it's really hard to comprehend and it is I mean uh, for me it was just tough to say okay Ezekiel 38 and 39 has nothing to do with the Middle East and has everything to do with America. And when I finally came to that realization, it turned out that Ezekiel 38 and 39 actually made more sense understanding this one very perplexing question or issue with Ezekiel 38 and 39. It says the house of Israel burned the weapons for seven years. So a lot of people will say, oh, you know, I'll ask people, hey, when, when, did he, when did they burn the weapons? They'll say, well, they burned the weapons seven years into the millennium. And I think, really? Seven years into the millennium? Well, how do we know that? Well, is there another seven-year period that we know that's in the Bible that will, is prophesied to occur? So I, I wonder if the house of Israel, this Christian church that has to be judged, I wonder if they're burning these weapons for seven years during the same time that you know that's a hard thing to think we're, we're gonna get into that but before I get too far quickly I did a video a while back where I tried to pinpoint the seven-year period to Daniel 90 Daniel 9 27 70 the week and don't forget that these two cows were born that to me nailed it down these two cows were born in the summer oh sorry in the late fall of um, 2014 so it just would seem to me that uh, this is incredibly unheard of it's a God sign that these this really determined our seven good years and our seven bad years you know the the 14 years that some people talk about you know Jacob worked seven years for Rachel then he had to turn around and work seven more years for Leah then he had a week in between where he got married to him in the middle of that so he got married between the seven good years and the seven, well, he had 14 years total. And then the um, this dream that Pharaoh had back in Genesis, I'm sorry. Um, um, yeah, it was Genesis, what I'm talking about. It was Joseph, where Joseph um, interpreted Pharaoh's dreams about the seven, the seven good cow, or fat cows, and the seven lean cows. So it's my thought that this is what it is. I mean, the fall of 2021, that's when this begins, based upon that dream, and actually two other, um, two other clues. And you can go. I have videos on this. You guys can go check. I'll leave a link for it. So, right now, where we are is right now. We are right here. If you can see my cursor. So let me jump into um, part of the study here, and to look at just the end of Ezekiel 38 and 39. Uh, this this gets kind of confusing here when you look at the end of this. Um, the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity. They fell by the sword, obviously. Um, and then it speaks about a future time. And then it makes a reference to, it says, when the Lord says, when I pour out my spirit upon the house of Israel. Now we know that uh, the spirit's poured out in Acts 2.17. But, but frankly, with Isaiah 32, and that's going to probably be the subject of the next video, I feel that I'm able to pinpoint, knowing knowing this, assuming this to be correct, I feel like I can point to 
guys, I'm sorry. I and mean, then you're probably not getting this. Point to the, t the actual time frame for Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I'm going to show you this. It's my opinion that Ezekiel 38 and 39, based on these dates of 2021 to 2028, that Ezekiel 38 and 39, the attack on the house of Israel or Israel, uh, will be in the July time frame of 2021, the summer, the early summer of 2021. That's Ezekiel 38. And then they burn the weapons for seven years. So with that, let's go back to my original study here about how do we, how can we even come to this conclusion? Because you could, you could go to 99% of biblical scholars and you ask them about Ezekiel 38 and 39. They're just going to start parroting what everybody else says about it. So let's start from the beginning and show biblically how we can determine this idea of Israel. Okay, so the most confusing topic in biblical prophecy is are the Jews who are the descendants of the southern kingdom of Judah, are they to carry the name of Israel? Let's examine the Bible's own words instead of man's traditions. Bible prophecy is impossible to understand if we stray from God's word for what it literally says. Okay, so let's look what God says to, to Jacob. Genesis 32, God says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Okay, so Jacob's new name is Israel. And then God in um, Genesis 35, he gives him a little bit more information. So he says, so he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God, of, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. Kings shall come from your own body. So Jacob is going to have um, people, uh, a singular nation and a company of nations. Genesis 48. Here, this is when Jacob comes to Joseph down in Egypt. And Jacob starts to explain to Joseph a similar concept that God spoke to Jacob in Genesis 35. But Jacob only speaks about a company of a company of peoples that will come from you. Jacob coincidentally leaves out this part about the nation. And I would say the reason that Jacob doesn't mention this singular nation to Joseph is this singular nation doesn't apply to Joseph. Only the part about the company of nations, the company of peoples applies to Joseph. And Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, combined the two of them, they are the company of peoples. And this singular nation is held out for somebody else. And we'll get into that in a second. So this is the kicker. This is the verse, Genesis 48, verse 16, is the verse that in, that's the most forgotten verse in the Bible. Everyone is unable to, when you ask the question, uh, for the most part, people that just think Israel is Jewish, they just forget about this and they just ignore Jacob's words. So Jacob says to uh, Joseph, as he's blessing Ephraim and Manasseh and giving Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two oldest sons, the birthright blessing. So he says, Jacob says, bless these boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, and let in them my name which is Israel, be carried on the name of my fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and let them, Ephraim and Manasseh, grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So right there we have it. These two boys, Ephraim and Manasseh, the company of peoples that comes from these two boys, and we'll talk about that, who that is. You, you guys know the answer already. That these, th this is the tribe. These two tribes are to carry the name of Israel. So, we have two prophetic events here. We have two facts that come out of this. Ephraim and Manasseh carry the name Israel, not Judah or the Jews. And they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. So is the modern Jewish state located in the Middle East a multitude in the midst of the earth? The answer is no, obviously. It's not. It's about the population of Maryland, 6 million Jews. they got about 2 million Arabs there. The modern, the Jewish state of Israel is 2% Christian. Okay, it's 70% Jewish, 20% Arab or Muslim, rather. So therefore, is 
Therefore, the modern nation, it's called Israel today, the Jewish state, does not meet the statements by Jacob. Therefore, calling the Jewish state in the Middle East Israel is, is incorrect as far as the Bible is concerned. So why do, why do people think this? How did this come about? Well, I'm going to twist scripture a little bit, and I'm going to give you my answer. <laughs> Genesis 3.1 uh, my version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually say the Jewish state would be called the name of Israel? Now I'm kidding with that. It doesn't say that. Okay. <laughs> actually, no. The, the devil has made everyone think that this Rothschild inspired regathering of Jewish people, which the Jewish people are still part of God's chosen people, because all of Israel, the whole house of Israel that started at Mount Sinai, they are the chosen people to become a kingdom of priests. They're not chosen for salvation. They're chosen to be God's, uh, God's ambassadors, all the children of Israel that were at Mount Sinai. Not just Jewish people who I cringe when they say, well, the Jewish people are chosen by God. Chosen for what? No. It's all of Israel. Okay? So, this Rothschild-inspired regathering of Jewish people whom God refers to, they are the house of Judah in biblical prophecy. In biblical prophecy, there's Judah and Israel. Let's talk about that right here. Okay? So, what about the singular nation in Genesis 35:11? Okay? It's not mentioned in Genesis 48. Okay? Do we see a nation and a company of nations mentioned elsewhere in Scripture? And this is another pet peeve. People talk about the distress for Jacob, Jacob's trouble, and they think it's a Jewish problem. Let's see what it says. For behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, and I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord. And I will bring them back into the land I gave their fathers, and they shall take possession of it. These are the words the Lord spoke to me concerning Israel and Judah. Now this prophecy is a future prophecy. This was never fulfilled back when Jeremiah wrote it. And the house of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, was attacked and ransacked and carried off to Babylon. This was not fulfilled back then. This is fulfilled when planet X flies by. Okay. Thus says the Lord, we have heard a cry of panic, of terror, of no peace. Ask now and see, can a man bear a child? Why do I see every man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labor? Why has every face turned pale? Alas, the day is so great, there is none like it. This is the day of the Lord. It is a time of distress for Jacob. Jacob, when you see Jacob, is the combination of Israel and Judah, all that came from Jacob's body. Yet he, Jacob, shall be saved out of it. Now consider this verse from Jeremiah 23. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. That's Jesus. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. So, these people think that Israel and Judah are synonymous. It's like one group of people with two names. Well, here we have the we have this group, these two individual groups that have different things occurring to them. So they can't be the same group with two names. It doesn't make any sense. One group is saved, and one group will dwell securely. So these are future prophetic. These are future prophetic events that point to two groups, Israel and Judah. And we know that Judah, or the house of Judah, are the Jews. But Israel, can we identify this modern group? So obviously we know who it is at this point. But I want to just show something quickly to you guys. I'm gonna, we're going to do a Bible search on Israel dwelling securely. So do we think that this is Jeremiah 23, verse 5. Let's go to the Bible and let's search on these key words. Israel dwells securely. Oh, here, here we have two other places where we have Israel dwelling securely. Isn't that weird? Huh. Knowing that Israel has nothing to do with Judah. It's kind of weird, isn't it? So, let's go back. Alright, so we've established two different people groups, Judah and Israel. Uh, 
So what, what happened was, let me go back to the beginning. Okay, so we, we know that Israel, the whole house of Israel, the United Kingdom, okay, started in around 1200 BC when they entered the Promised Land. And we had 12 tribes occupying 13 states, two Manassas. And it, it was like this way for a little over 200 years. 12 tribes, 13 states. Now the Levites did not have their own state. They were the priests. They would have a little outpost in each tribe, each state. 12 tribes, 13 states. Okay. Then we know around 930 BC, uh, the northern kingdom got irritated with Rehoboam, Solomon's son. It was Saul, David, Solomon. Solomon had a son named Rehoboam. The northern ten tribes got irritated because they were being taxed too much and they separated from the southern two tribes and Jeroboam became the king of Israel. That's the yellow here, the king of Israel, ten tribes. The capital was Samaria, the chief tribe was Ephraim. And Judah, Rehoboam became the king, became, was the king of Judah. The capital, Jerusalem, the chief tribe was Judah, but there was Benjamin with him. And so the, the two tribes existed simultaneously from about 930 BC to 722 BC where Israel was conquered and dispersed and they became the lost ten tribes. They went up into Western Europe, up into the UK and uh, later on when Jesus came onto the scene he said I was only sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's who he came for. And those lost sheep were found at the foot of the cross. That's how it works out. So we know Israel. So what happens is, what gets confusing is, is we'll have prophecies written 2,600 years ago. Like this prophecy here was written 2,600 years ago. And it refers to Israel. But when this was written, when Jeremiah wrote this prophecy, there was no kingdom of Israel. It, it, they were lost. But Jeremiah is referring to these guys as if they exist. Well, they exist because they, he could not, he couldn't call them Christians. He couldn't do that back then. He didn't know they were Christians. He just knew that they would be like Israel. That's who it is. And Judah would be the Jews. So this prophecy will be fulfilled in a future sense with Christians and Jews. That's, that's how we figure this out. And that's the confusion. Okay. All right. Um, so I went through that. Yeah. Um, yep. Explained it. So this is imperative to understand the difference between Israel and Judah in a future prophetic sense. This is confuses everybody, and it's it's mind numbing to try to get this point across at times because. People think what they do is they pick up prophecy from the Old Testament and they'll say, well, that wasn't fulfilled. And they'll, it'll make a reference to Israel and Judah. And they'll just think Israel is this little teeny tiny nation in the Middle East when it's not. Okay. Let me, let me just jump with more justification about this. So who are the lost sheep of the house of Israel? I already mentioned this before. It says when Jesus returns to the earth, we know that the non-believing Jews will join the believing Christians, that's what will make them Christians, in their singular belief that Jesus is their Messiah and there will be one flock of believers under Jesus. The two houses, the Jews and the Christians, Judah and Israel will reunite and that's exactly what the prophecies say down here later. We'll get to it in a second. But here's an example of Hosea who writes a prophecy in 750 B.C that will be fulfilled in our future. Okay, so Hosea writes, for Israel, the lost ten tribes, who are now the Christians, for Israel has forgotten his maker and built palaces, and Judah has multiplied fortified cities, so I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour her strongholds. Jeremiah 3, for the Lord said to me, faithless Israel, has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. See how see how with Israel the Lord uses this concept, this theme of faith. I find that interesting. All right, in Matthew 15, Jesus says, "I was only sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel." 
So he's Jesus publicly states that his first coming was only for these lost ten tribes. He must have known that Judah were not lost at the time. Of course, they were mostly his disciples. Then Jesus made this other strange statement about another flock. So Jesus said, as he was speaking to his Jewish disciples, he says, And I have other sheep that are not of this fold, Judah, that I will must bring, that I must bring them also, and they will listen to me. They will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. This is the same thing it says in Ezekiel 37. So the question is, who is this other flock that Jesus is talking about? Well, it's the faithful Christians of today. We see the same thing in Jeremiah 3. So Jeremiah 3 is a future prophecy. How do we know it's future? Because it makes a reference to, he says, And at that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord. So Jesus makes a reference to this throne in Matthew 25. And right now, in Jerusalem, Jesus the Messiah is not currently on the throne. There is no throne, actually. In Jerusalem but there will be and it will be occupied by Jesus at some future point and it says right here when Jesus says when the Son of Man comes in his glory and with all the angels with him then he will sit on his glorious throne and if you go to Jeremiah 3 17 this is what happens and at that time the throne of the Lord will be called in Jerusalem and all the nations shall gather to it that the presence of the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem now it doesn't say that's Jeremiah 3 but we didn't know who his name was back then. They shall no more stubbornly follow after their own evil heart. In those days, in the future, the house of Judah, be the Jews, shall join, walk together, what the Hebrew says, the house of Israel. They, the the regathering, the re the reunion of the two houses of Israel, sorry, Israel and Judah, will occur when the Messiah comes. And it says that the Jews will join Israel. Because Israel already believes in Jesus. That's why they're joining them. I have friends that tell me it goes the other way around. That when Jesus comes, all of a sudden we're all going to become Jewish. It, it doesn't say that. Jeremiah is not saying that. The house of Judah will join the house of Israel. And the house of Israel are the Christians. Of today. Okay. More justification. So when you go to Romans chapter 9, you can read about Paul. Paul was really good in quoting Old Testament scripture. And when he quotes this scripture, we can logically deduce from his context who this, who this people is. So in Romans chapter 9, Paul says, In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which the Lord, uh, the Lord God has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, we'll get to that in a second. Those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not my beloved, I will call my beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called the sons of the living God. So there's a group of people who were kicked out of the land of Israel. This group right here, Israel, in 722 BC, God divorced the northern kingdom of Israel. He told Jeremiah in chapter 3, I wrote a decree of divorce for the northern kingdom of Israel because of their idolatry. And then they were called not my people, according to the prophet Hosea. So where they were called, you are not my people, there they will all of a sudden be called the sons of the living God. The same people, their descendants, I can only assume. As Isaiah cries out concerning the northern kingdom of Israel, though the, though the number of the sons of Israel be a saint, as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will be saved. Actually, that's Isaiah 10, saved from God's judgment. Because if you read Isaiah 10, only a small remnant will be protected, saved, taken to heaven, that's what it says in Isaiah 10, when the decree of destruction occurs. And then Isaiah 11, there'll be a group of people who will endure that destruction. They will be tried in the furnace, refined, and then he'll come back again for a second rapture. That's what it says in Isaiah 11. 
Isaiah 11, 11, it's the second rapture. Anyway, I digress. So here's the Hosea. This is, so Paul is quoting from Hosea. And when Paul does this, he gives us the answer. These people who were called, not my people, who all of a sudden, at the foot of the cross, become God's people, the sons of the living God, these people, they are the children of Israel. Because Paul, because uh, Hosea calls them that. Let's go right here. Yet the number of the children of Israel, the lost ten tribes, shall be like the sand of the sea. Same thing as Isaiah said. Which cannot be numbered. Well, currently on the planet, there's two and a half billion Christians out of seven billion. And in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, Israel, because they went after idols, God kicked them out of the land, it shall be said to them in a future time, children, sons of the living God. And the children of Judah, that's the Jews of today, and the children of Israel, that's the lost who have been found at the cross, shall be gathered together in the future, Jews and Christians reunited, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, one leader, one Messiah, and they shall go up from the land, for great is the day of Jezreel. The day of Jezreel is the day of sowing. Jesus speaks about a parable of the weeds of the sower, and Jesus says that the day of Jezreel is at the end of the age. So it proves that Hosea 1, verses 10 and 11, are a future fulfillment event at the day of the end of the age. So we learn from this that the children of Israel, let me highlight them there, children of Israel, this proves it. There, this, there's no way you can go with the children of Israel are the children of the living God who were called, you are not my people. That's who the Christians are today. They're the remnant, they're, they're, they're the, the offspring of this group. So the lost have been found at the foot of the cross. That's what I say right here. And there's three more, pro Ezekiel speaks about this, and so does Jeremiah 54. Same thing. So the conclusion here, when I'm all said and done speaking about this, is this is not replacement theology. And boy, do I get uptight when people accuse me of that. What happens is the reason that the, well, the church has not replaced the Jews the Jews of today are identified in unfulfilled prophecy as the children of Judah or the house of Judah. The lost ten tribes whom Jesus only came for and found them at the foot of the cross, they are the children of Israel, the house of Israel. Okay, so this is what some people would say. Some people would say that in, in 636 B.C., so the Judah was exiled in 606 B.C., and they returned 70 years later in 536 B.C. So they were not lost. Judah is not lost. They're not lost today. But when Judah returned in 536 B.C., some scholars say that a remnant, a small group of leftover Israelites of the northern kingdom, joined them as they were on their way from Babylon back to Jerusalem. And then that's when the reunification occurred. I've had very smart people tell me that. And I say, well, hold on a minute now. So these this remnant joined, and they did. There was a group, a small remnant of Israelite that did join Judah. And those people are called the people of Israel and Judah. If you go to Ezekiel 37, we'll go there in a minute, and that's where they're identified. The problem is that the actual reunification of the lost ten tribes, remember, the lost ten tribes are more numerous than the sand of the sea. Look what it says right here. It says, The children of Israel in this future prophecy shall be like the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. Okay, So if they claim the reunification occurred in 536 B.C., there's no way that the, that the Jewish people of today, who would be these Jews and these Israelites, this you know, reunion group, that they would be considered more than the more than the sand of the sea. It doesn't make any sense. So the reunification of the lost ten tribes and Judah occurs when Jesus returns, exactly like it says here in Jeremiah three, and in Hosea ten. I'm sorry, Hosea one, verses ten and eleven. 
So that's how you're able to fight off that argument. So the bottom line is, the Christians of today are the house of Israel, the children of Israel. The Jews of today are the house of Judah, or the children of Judah. When you see the word Judah in Scripture, it's referring to Benjamin Netanyahu's country, Judah. That's Judah. Let me give you an example. This is the one that I think we're going to actually see fulfilled very shortly. Okay, Hosea 5 is all about, Hosea 5 is all about Israel and Ephraim. This is prophecy for the United States and the Christian nations. But look what it says right here. It says, uh, sound the alarm. We follow you, O Benjamin Netanyahu. Ephraim shall become a desolation, the day of punishment, among the tribes of Israel, the Western Christian nations. But the princes of Judah, there you go, princes, two of them, the princes of Judah, Benjamin and Benjamin, have become like those who move that boundary line, that landmark, up in the Golan Heights. And God's going to pour out his wrath like water. At the same time, he's going to crush Ephraim at the same time. And then Ephraim and Judah will see their wound. And then Ephraim's going to run after the Assyrian some people might think that's our former president. Could be. Probably is. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim and a young lion to the house of Judah. So I'm going to be like a lion to the U.S. and a young lion to the Jews, the Jewish people, I think, in the U.S. And I will tear and go away and carry off and no one can rescue. And Jesus says, I will return to my place in heaven until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. Okay. So, go back to my document. So, the lost have been found. It's the children of Israel. Israel has nothing to do with Jewishness. Okay. Um, let, let's give another example here. So, in Ecclesiastes it says, What has been done is what will be done. What has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Sorry, it's what has been done is what will be. Sorry, guys. So the beginnings of the USA, Ephraim, Israel, looks eerily familiar to the beginnings of the whole house of Israel in 1250 B.C. I just find this weird. I've shown it before. So there, on the left here, Maine was called Massachusetts. So there's 13 states on the left with two Massachusetts's. <laughs> One's Maine, really now, but it was, was Massachusetts then. And there's two Manassas. I just find that strange how it worked out that, that way. Guys, and here's a, how can we identify Ephraim and Manasseh? I think at this point, basically most followers who are on my channel know that Ephraim is the USA. And here's the justification for it. But the, <clears throat> the important part is Genesis 48, 19. It's where Joseph tried to stop his father Jacob from giving Ephraim the higher blessing. But Joseph said, I know my son, I know Joseph. He, Manasseh, will also become a people, and he will be great, Great Britain, Manasseh. Nevertheless, the younger brother, Ephraim, shall be greater than Manasseh. And Ephraim's offspring shall become a multitude of nations. Now, this multitude of nations really means, if you look up the words in Hebrew, it means that Ephraim shall become a nation full of peoples or nations. What other what other nation on the planet, the U.S., is a nation that is full of immigrants? That's exactly who we are. And this famous painting proves it. We all know who the USA is. We're a melting pot. We are a nation full of peoples. The USA is a nation where people from other nations have gathered. And that's exactly what it says in let me show you guys something. I'm going to read you a prophecy that you probably have heard, but I just I just pulled out some of the words. So it's it's called the mystery prophecy. Okay? So it goes like this. It says you, this person you is somebody who's going to attack this nation of unwalled villages. He says you will advance coming up like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. You and all your hordes Remember that word hordes and cloud. Just remember that. OK. 
Okay. Thus says the Lord, on that, thus says the Lord your God, on that day, thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil scheme, and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. Unwalled villages. You, you ever seen this place before? This is um, Jerusalem. Do you see any walls there? Uh, you can look, you see walls all over the darn place. They're everywhere. This, not, this nation, the modern nation of Israel, the Jewish state, is nothing but walls. They, they even have walls practically around their entire country. So this is a picture of Israel's walls, the Jewish state of Israel is what I call it. Okay, so they have, they have a wall all along here, Egypt and Gaza. They have a wall up on the northern Golan Heights area, comes all the way down, goes all the way around the West Bank, Okay, walls. The only place they don't have a wall is their border with Jordan. That's it. They have 800 miles of wall in this little tiny nation that's the size of New Jersey. Now, do you know how many miles of wall the U.S. has around its country? <laughs> well, before Trump's wall, we had about 700 miles of wall on the southern border. The northern border in the U.S. has no walls. So the U.S. is a nation essentially without walls. The villages don't have walls. So let me go back to that mystery prophecy. I'm sorry, guys. That's not the one. So the mystery prophecy goes like this. On that day, thoughts will come into your mind. You will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon a people who are dwelling securely, all of them dwelling without walls, having no bars or gates, to seize, spoil, and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited. And the people who were gathered from the nations, who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth, Okay, so this country that this attacker is going to come up against is a land of unwalled villages, dwelling securely. And this land, this people, this nation is a people who were gathered from the nations. And who did we just say that that was? Who was? Who was? What did? What did Jacob say would become of this Ephraim? Ephraim would become a nation full of nations. Ephraim shall become a multitude full of nations. And that's exactly what this mystery prophecy, you guys know what this is, right? There's not a mystery. Is it really a mystery? Is it really a mystery anymore? It's not. This, this changes everything about what we believe as far as biblical end time prophecy. Now, this I want to share with you about this hordes and these clouds. Okay, Hordes and clouds. Hordes of people from this army covering the land like a cloud, like a storm. Okay, have you guys ever heard of this? This is George Washington's vision of America. Now, I never really gave this too much credence. And you can go to Snopes and they'll say it was fabricated in some newspaper in 1859 or whatever it was. I actually have a friend who found it in a newspaper from 1821. He found it in the Library of Congress. It was in a newspaper. I forget the name of the newspaper. But he literally found, he has a copy of it from 1821, a newspaper, where this was in there, word for word. Okay, so George Washington got a vision from an angel, and it was three perils. One was the revolution, one was the civil war, and the third peril was America's judgment. So I'm not saying, I'm not here to say that this is, quote, inspired, godly, 100% correct, that we would put our faith in it. But let's just look at it and see the similarity between this mystery prophecy, which we know is Ezekiel 38, in this land of unwalled villages that is a land of people who were gathered from the many nations, which we know to be the USA. Let's see what George Washington was told was seen in his vision. I'm not going to read the whole thing. He says that, a, <clears throat> that there was an attack coming from Europe, Asia, 
in Africa, Europe, Russia, Asia, China, Africa, Libya. Do you ever read Ezekiel 38? Same, same places, okay? From each of these countries arose a thick black clouds that were soon joined into one cloud. Throughout the mass, they, they gleamed a dark red light, which I saw hordes of armed men who were moving with a cloud. Our country was enveloped by the volume of a cloud. Vast armies devastated the whole country and burned the villages and cities and towns. Okay, This dark cloud enveloped America. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You guys can download this document and you guys can read it. But that sounds a lot like Ezekiel 38, doesn't it? Kind of interesting if you think about it. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to do another video where I'm going to make an honest attempt to take scripture, break it down, and show you how and why I think Ezekiel 38 occurs in the summer, June, July of 2021, based upon the seven year period going from fall of 2021 to the fall of 2028. With that, guys, have a great day and God bless you.